Um, before we get started, first we want to say thanks for all of our viewers on Facebook, on YouTube, and on MBR TV. And we also want to thank all the people behind the scenes who make uh, Truth or Politics happen. We want to thank MBR TV, producer back there, our Dave, our cameraman, also all things man and everybody behind the scenes to help with Truth or Politics. Also, we want to announce that uh, we had, we've been working hard, it took a year in the making. We uh, did a movie, basically, it's a two-part movie called Lake Cumberland, What Really Lies Beneath, where we exposed that the Somerset Wastewater Treatment Plant was um, it received numerous violations and was defective, and then they were running, basically, at this point, probably about 30 million gallons of uh, toxic waste from industrial landfills. Uh, through their tox through their defective system, which leads right into Pittman Creek, and then Pittman Creek bleeds into Lake Como. Anyways, we have had a tremendous response to this. Um, one one article I wrote in response had over 20,000 views. So um, this is currently posted. If you want to watch it, uh, part one and part two is on YouTube. Just type in Truth or Politics Lake Cumberland and it pops right up. Or you can go to our, our Truth or Politics Facebook pages. We have three of them now. We have teams in Pulaski County. We have a team over in Louisville and, of course, right here in uh, southeastern Kentucky. So I want to announce that because of the response of that overwhelming response that people want a public forum, we are going to do that. Um, the Truth of Politics team up in Pulaski County, we're going to get together and next Friday, the not tomorrow, next Friday the 29th at 6 o'clock at the uh, public library, the Somerset Public Library in downtown Somerset, right behind the uh, it's it's right right behind the uh, judicial center and and the and the courthouse, the new courthouse and stuff there. That's where it's going to be. We'll try to answer all your questions and let people talk and and just pretty much it's your public forum for the public to get together and air their concerns. Uh, we've also invited and sent this to you know the politicians. They're welcome to show up and and the mayor's welcome to show up and explain you know what is his plan if he wants. Uh, but that, this public forum is for the citizens to air their concerns. That's what it's primarily for. And again, that's next Friday, not tomorrow Friday, next Friday, April 29th at 6 p.m. at the uh, Somerset Public Library. So tonight we have two candidates here for jailer. And what we'll do is first we'll give them, oh, you know, a little bit of time for open. I'm not going to time them because nobody ever goes more than two minutes. Luckily, usually they don't even take up a minute, do they, Dave, <laughs> to answer the question. So we're going to what we'll do is we'll take turns going first. We'll go back and forth. You know, you'll go first first this time, and then next time you go first. I will lose track, so you guys will have to keep me honest here and then kind of remember who, who whose question it is next. But everybody will, will get a chance to answer all the questions and to be first on each question. So um, starting right now, we'll go ahead and, and Jesse, we'll start with you. You can do an opening remark and then and then. And then you do an opening remark, and then the next question, you go first, and then we'll go back and forth. Go ahead. Well, my name is Jesse Hatfield. I'm currently running for re-election for jailer in McCurry County. This will be my third term if I win. And I just appreciate you both and support. And I hope each and every one of you get out and vote, because that's uh, your choice. Hello everyone, I'm Trevin McCullough. I am running for jailer for the first time. Uh, I would appreciate everybody's vote. Uh, the people that I do know, I have uh, talked to and I've got some ideas and some things that I think I can implement and make a good change. And Not that things that are going bad right now, but I just think I could do a really good job with it. And I appreciate everyone getting out and voting and uh, exercising that right. Okay, first question. Okay, you will do this question first. Please describe what you believe to be the duties of office of jailer and any improvements that you th think that you could make. The office of jailer is about taking care of any matters that the county has with incarcerated individuals. Uh, in this case, we have a jailer here, but slash chief transport officer. So. What that entails, most people probably don't think about it until election time comes around. It's kind of one of those offices that uh, is not really public, but in this case, we just deal with transporting inmates from our county to the county that is holding them. In some cases, it could be with the county. Right now, it's Knox County. And uh, just getting them from point A to point B, and if 
and when they need to be transported to a institution such as the Rotary Correctional Complex, the in process and in processing center for the state, you know, you have to deal with transports in that fashion also. So uh, in our county, it just mainly deals with transports as of right now. But in the past, you would be running to jail and uh, you would just be uh, overseeing the budget and the day-to-day -day activities in the jail. My name is Jesse Hatfield. I am currently uh, jailer or chief transport officer. And we transport approximately 80 inmates per month to Knox County and we'll go to other surrounding counties and pick up inmates that's been picked up on McQuarrie County warrants and charges. And also we bring several people over to court two or three times a week. And that's another big job to do. I mean, it takes quite a few of us to do court because we have to have two deputies per van. And that's it's a long day. You know, it starts at five o'clock in the morning. A lot of days we don't get back in till seven or eight o'clock. So I think I do you a good job. Okay, so both of you have done that. Okay, so you went first this time. No, he went first this time. You go first. Right, you go first. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, that's because you did over and It's your turn to go first this time. What type of training is required, if any, to meet the requirements of this office? For example, academic, physical, etc. And do you believe the jailer should have reoccurrent training for their officers? And what should that be? Well, we do have training. We have uh, 40 hours a year of training we have to do every year. And I always attend training two times a year, and I've got approximately uh, 360 hours or more in on training. And yes, you do. Jailer has to have their training done every year. Okay, same question. Yes. Uh, to be able to be elected for the office, you don't have to have any prior training. Um, I have training prior to it. I've been working in corrections. I uh, started in 2015. And have a uh, history with the Kentucky Department of Corrections. Um, 16, 17, uh, 18, 19, and 20, I was working with the Luther Luckett Correctional Complex and the Rotary Correctional Complex in Oldham County, Kentucky. Um, I think it helps having prior experience, but there's no qualifications like whenever you sign up to run for jail, you don't have to have any. I think it is very important though to be security minded in a position like this because there's a lot of aspects of it, especially with the transport part, but you gotta keep in mind. Uh, positioning on um, where your weapon is, where your OC is, where the, uh, you know, having your inmates uh, cuffed, having the double locks applied to the handcuffs. Some of the, you know, some of the viewers might not know about that. But there is a double lock on the handcuffs, things like that. Uh, and just being security minded anytime you're transporting somebody that's incarcerated, maybe intoxicated, uh, you know, that all brings its own set of risk involved with it as well. So you have to be security minded, professional, and training is very important. Okay, Jesse, did both of you answer that one? Yep. Okay. Okay. Did you answer that one too? The, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with something going on on my phone right now. Okay. So who went first last time? Okay, so you go first this time. Okay. What what do you believe is the biggest jailer related problem and, and what is your plan to fix this issue? The biggest jailer related problem, what is your plan to fix this issue? Uh, the biggest jailer related problem right now that we have is it's the a chief transport officer position. So being able to have a jail would be great. Um, and one of the things that happened, you know, that shows that McCurry County is ready for some change is the alcohol tax went through, right? It's a wet county now at this point. And one of the things about that is the funds that is made from the taxes on the alcohol can be used for law enforcement purposes, i.e. some of them can be put back for a jail facility. Some of the stuff, uh, the building that the past jail was in is not, it's not usable, um, it was shut down, but there, I'm sure there's still some of the parts in it that were, could be recycled and used in another building. It won't be a one year deal, it won't be a two year deal, but it will be a process and that would be some of the building blocks from it being able to use the alcohol tax to be able to move forward with a facility. I think the most important problem that we have right now with the jailer position is just not having a jail. 
Okay, uh, what is the biggest jailer related problem and what is your plan to address this issue? Well, we transport every day and I don't know if we've got a problem right now with it because we've got trained deputies, I'm trained. And when I first started, we didn't have no equipment in the cars, didn't have nothing. And, uh, now we've got GPSs on each car and every uh, vans and we've got cameras, audio and video and uh, all my staff, they're well trained, they do their training every year. and. I think everything's going to be good. Okay. This is one of my pet peeves, and I've asked every candidate every which way we can about this, is the littering problem. We clearly have a littering problem, especially along the roadways, that really affects us in every way. It affects tourism. It just makes us look like a bad neighborhood, you know. Is there anything that the jailer could do to assist with this problem? Well, if we've had an open jail, we could assist with the problem. I mean, we'd have inmates out on the road every day picking up garbage and stuff. But we don't have a jail at this time, and, you know, most garbage that gets picked up around here is by groups that participate in the cleanup, and they pay them, I believe, $50 per mile to pick up the garbage and stuff, you know. We have the fall, we have the clean up on Highway 90 every year and that helps a lot and you know they just and they've been writing a few citations for littering so maybe that'll help a lot. The biggest problem with the littering it, yeah the so for the position of jailer um, the littering as uh, Jailer Hatfield said we could have some of the inmates come over and pick up trash we could still do that even now uh, what would have to happen is we would just have to task a deputy jailer out with it, uh, or say perhaps two deputy jailers out with it. It would cost, uh, you know, just paying the deputy jailers for that day. They would have to pay the, you know, we'd have to have the gas there and back to Knox County, Corbin, Kentucky, to be able to go up, pick up, transport the inmates here and back. But yeah, say you make it an eight-hour day, uh, two hours for travel, ten-hour day for the uh, deputy jailers, just to oversee and uh, be there watching the inmates pick up the trash. We still do it even now uh, in present times without the jail. Okay, did both of you answer the trash question, correct? Yes? Okay, uh, next question. Who goes first this time? Him, okay. Uh, what would you do as jailer to make your office become more transparent to the public? Uh, one, of the, one of the things I would do to make the office more transparent to the public would be I think people knowing about you know what corrections is a lot of it's not seen so uh, transparency is not going to be there because unless you've uh, been to jail or worked inside of a jail a lot of people only know what they see on TV about a jail but uh, one of the biggest things with uh, working in corrections in particular is just being fair firm and consistent and if you can be uh, <coughs> fair with the individuals you deal with you've got to be firm about it and then uh, you be the same person every day and you'll get good results. In my experience with it, the six years I've been in it, I've had good results out of it. Well, I think I am transparent with people. I mean, these inmates I deal with day in and day out. I just about know the birthday, but I do anything to help them. And uh, if I can help them, uh, get a bond or something, they'll get their bond and we bond out several people per month and you know, their family calls and want to know, like on court day, when I bring them over here to court and the judge releases them, they'll holler at me and say, hey Jess, would you wait on so and so and give them a ride back? And I always do that and help them get back home and you know, I think I'm pretty transparent with people. And we've got an open door policy. Okay, both of you guys are answer transfer. Okay. Has the fact that we do not have a jail had an effect on this office, and what would you request or do in order to help this situation? Well, but not having a jail, I'm sure it has effect on some things, you know, like uh, the sheriff's department and stuff, you know, before when we had a jail, they just ran them to the, down to the jail and drop them off and do their paperwork stuff, but 
you know now, they got the college transport officer, and then we meet them at the sheriff's office. Then the time they get their paperwork and everything done, you know, uh, we're there most of the time before they ever get their paperwork done. But, you know, having the jail would be a lot handier on everybody. I mean, they'd be handier on court date and everything because we just have to bring from the jail to court, but now we're traveling 58 miles each way to go get them and bring them back, and, you know. It's a little unhandy, but sometimes you have to do stuff that you have to do. The question is, how has it affected the county in the position? What would you do as jailer? Or so how has, excuse me, sorry, has the fact that we do not have a jail had an effect on this office, and what would you request or do in order to help the situation? Yes, it's had an effect on the office. Uh, as soon as they took the jail out, the jail was closed down. Uh, everything, any inmate that was here had to be put somewhere else. So there's transport costs there, and plus, not only transport costs, there's housing costs, because our county has to pay whatever county that's housing the inmates to house them there. And not to mention that, on the flip side of it, McCourty County ended up losing out money too because the inmates that we housed on the county level, we were getting money for, we were getting more money for the state level inmates because you've got a jail that can house county level inmates, it can also house state level inmates. And we get more money for each state level inmate that we house, uh, almost double what we would get per county inmate. So there was income lost in that aspect of it, and plus there was more county for the transports that we do and any overtime that goes along with it, depending on where we're housing our inmates at. Uh, the way I would like to solve that is, you know, piggybacking one off uh, of what I said earlier, just be trying to use uh, whatever portion of the alcohol tax fund, or the alcohol taxes that we can get to put forth into getting a new jail uh, area for a jail and uh, aspiring to get a jail open back up. That would be the idea. Okay, both answer that right. Do you think that technology could be could better serve the office of jailer in doing their jobs? And what would you choose for that technology to be? All right. The technology is always good to have um, body cameras, uh, things of that nature. Uh, body cameras just being one example of it, but. If you have a body camera on and you're working in a correctional institution, you uh, already know exactly what happened. You don't have to question it, plus the cameras that you have in above inside of a corrections facility. Uh, in this particular position, being transport officers, you'll have uh, dash cameras, and you can have body cameras also. And it, uh, it's, you know, if something has to go to court and there's a reason for uh, any discrepancies, it fills in the gaps of this side of the story and that side of the story. It tells you, okay, the camera doesn't lie. Whatever happened, it's going to show it. Um, other technologies that you can use, a rack belt. Uh, you know, for a lot of you viewers, you might not know what a rack belt is, but it is a belt that is used when inmates go to court on uh, court uh, transports. And it just goes underneath an inmate's uh, uniform. And if, uh, say, an inmate's getting sentenced or something along those lines and an inmate lashes out because of the sentencing, um, it's just a way of getting them into a compliance position. You know, so technology has a great deal of, deal, uh, great deal of an effect on crisis, yes. Same question. Well, technology for transport and stuff, you know, that goes a long ways, and I think we have went a long ways. I mean, we went from nothing to what we've got now. I mean, we've got... Uh, cameras, audio, video, and we've got GPS, and we've got all new equipment. We've got two 2021 chargers, got a new van, we've got another van coming this week, and uh, we've got up to date equipment, and uh, I think we do a good job at what we do. and. Coming back around to opening the jail, that old jail it won't never be open. And another thing, if you got two million dollars a year on alcohol money for took in, 
the jail wouldn't get a nickel of that. That's for law enforcement only, alcohol sales are, the money that they get off of it. It's for uh, sheriff's department only, law enforcement. It ain't made for nothing. You couldn't use one penny of it for a jail. Okay, you got to go answer that one, right? Do you believe that all elected officials, especially anyone involved with law enforcement and incarceration, should have to take periodic random drug screenings? Yes, I think everybody ought to have drug screening. I mean, uh, we uh, before we hire anybody to do transports or anything, they have to do a background check stuff. And then when the background check comes back, if it's okay. Before they ever hire them, they make them do a drug test, and I think that ought to be required on any job. And I'd be willing to do a drug test any time or any day. It wouldn't matter to me because I think it should be required. Yes, uh, drug test should be required, background check. It just gives you an idea of who you're hiring. That's why all the hiring agencies have it. Okay, what do you think makes a good jailer? I think a good jailer is someone that can, that has social skills, can talk to people because in some of the situations you get into with an inmate, uh, you're going to have to uh, be able to de-escalate situations. Uh, it's a big part of the corrections field and not only that, you're going to have to be firm, like I talked about earlier, fair, firm, and consistent. You're going to have to be firm when you have to be, too. So being relatable and being able to have social skills, and not only that, but being able to be assertive when you have to be as well. Um, and you've got to be able to be uh, kind of wear more than one hat at certain times. Because like I said, sometimes you're going to have to be able to uh, be understanding. Uh, depending on, I've had situations where people have lost family members, they've been incarcerated, uh, maybe they've lost their wife, you know, and situations like that, you know, we're not mental health professionals, but there are mental health professionals that work in the line of corrections. You need to get them into somebody that can talk to them and that can help them through that situation because uh, you know, losing a family member, they could be a suicide risk. There's a lot of things that come involved with it. So you've got to be able to think outside the box on certain situations, just be open to anything. Well, I think I am a good jailer. I mean, I treat everybody fair, I treat them honest, and I tell them, I'll treat you how you treat me. And you know, that goes a long ways. I mean, if they're good to me, I'm good to them. Like one instant, on the van one day, I had a little boy. He kept moving around in different seats. And I told him, I said, you need to sit still in the same seat and keep the, uh, and sit where I tell you. Well, he just kept moving around. And I didn't say nothing to him, no more. And uh, the next exit I got off that hour, when I got off that hour, Exit 11, there's about three or four carloads of law sitting there waiting, and uh, he couldn't believe it. He said, ain't no any stopping, ain't no any stopping. I'll do what you tell me. And uh, I just had to take them all off the van and cuff them behind. And uh, when they got back to the jail, they told the rest of them back, I guess. But I ain't had no trouble with everybody since. But, you know, sometimes, if they don't listen, you have to do something different. But I'm always, I like to be good to everybody. Okay, and now we'll have um, a closing arguments or just whatever you guys want to say. And I think you, let's see, you just went first, that'll be you go first this time. Closing arguments. My name is Jesse Hatfield. Uh, I'm asking for a re election for a jailer. Uh, this will be my third term as a jailer. I think I've done you a great job, and uh, I just like to get out and vote each and every one of you. And uh, like I say, when I first started this job, we didn't we had vehicles, but they weren't really that good. But I mean, we've come a long way since I started, and uh, you can ask anybody about my work or my job. 
I treat everybody honest and fire, and I'd just like to ask for your vote for another term. And like I say, this will be my third term if I win in May. So I'm asking each and every one of you to get out on May the 17th and vote Jesse Hatfield from McCoy County Jail. Thanks. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Trevin McCullough, 29 years old, and I'm asking anybody that is a Republican to come out on May 17th, vote for me for jail in McQuarrie County. And uh, I wanted to also uh, go back on what we were talking about. Um, the way I understand it for the alcohol tax, it was for law enforcement use and jailer corrections officers. I always considered it law enforcement. So um, if it's just uh, an overshadow of just law enforcement and it doesn't specify sheriff's department, I think that would be another avenue because I always consider corrections officers, they're a jailer, law enforcement as well. I hope everybody comes out and votes, exercises that right from Trevor McCullough, and I hope you vote for me May 17th, 2022 for jail. Okay, folks. You know, it takes a lot of guts to show up and answer these questions like that, and every candidate that shows up here, you know, this, this ain't fun for them guys. I mean, this is not no picnic to them. <laughs> but very few of them enjoy this, so they deserve a big round of applause for showing up, everybody. We appreciate it. So, folks, yeah, um, next week, next Thursday. By the way, this will be uploaded on Facebook and YouTube by noon tomorrow. So that's fair, by noon tomorrow. So uh, hopefully you'll get it by noon tomorrow, and it'll be on NBR TV tonight. So, um, again, next week, next Thursday, we have the state representative debate. Um, that's between uh, Upchurch and uh, uh, King. Upchurch and King are the two candidates for that. They will be here. Uh, or they've been asked to be here. I'm assuming they're going to show up. And so that'll be a good debate next Thursday at 6 o'clock. Again, um, unfortunately, we're not opening these debates to, to the public like we used to because of COVID. Hopefully, maybe, you know, next year or this fall, we can, we can go back to what we used to do. Also, we want to put out once again, there is a public forum for anybody, and that's citizens of McCrary County, too, that boat and fish and everything up there in Pittman Creek and Lake Cumberland. If you are concerned about uh, our, what we have discovered in our report, this is a public forum. It's free. Anybody can come. It's not tomorrow. It's next Friday, April 29th at 6 p.m. at the uh, Public Library, Somerset Public Library. And we hope everybody shows up, and, uh, and we'll try to answer questions or people can just discuss what their concerns are. And, and this is in response, again, we had, I say dozens, hundreds of phone calls and emails and private messages that people want some kind of public forum. So that is going to be provided for you on April 29th. And we will see you next time on Truth or Politics. Thanks.